Hello everyone! As you all should know by now, I am Balatami Akinriade, a doctoral student of occupational therapy, and this is video number three of the Autism Educational Series, which is in collaboration with the Ike Foundation for Autism. In this video, I'm going to talk about the hyper and hypo sensitivities of each of the senses and two of the sensory systems, and then hopefully you'll be able to observe or identify some of your child's sensory needs. And to understand the meaning of hyper and hypo sensitivities, please refer to my last video where I explained that with some examples as well. Again, this is going to be a very brief video about the senses. If you have specific questions about your child's sensory needs, please consult with a registered occupational therapist or speak with your child's primary health care provider. So without further ado, let's get started. So the first one I'm going to talk about is vision. So that is sight, what you see. And so children who are hypersensitive with sight, they may be the ones who don't like bright lights. They might look down a lot because they are avoiding the bright light above them. They might be the ones that avoid eye contact with people because it's too stimulating, it's too sensitive for them. And they also might be the ones who enjoy playing in the dark compared to playing when it's very bright outside or inside. Children who are hyposensitive are the ones who like the light. They might be the ones who will take any shiny object or any type of light or flashlight and put it close to their eye so they're getting as much sensory input as possible. These children might also be the ones who have difficulties with differentiating between different sizes, colors, or shapes of things. And they also might have difficulty completing puzzles because they are hyposensitive to their sense. Their senses are dull, so they have difficulty differentiating between these things. The next one I'm going to talk about is auditory sounds. Children who are hypersensitive to sound, they may be the ones that get distracted, startled, or even scared when they hear a noise that might be normal or typical for you and I. I've seen this with children who might get scared when they hear the toilet flush or when they hear uh, a door slam as well. These children also might cover their ears when they hear a sound that they don't like or if something's too loud. They also may be the ones who will hum or make their own noise as a way to drown out the outside noises that they hear. So it's almost as a coping mechanism for them. Children who are hyposensitive are the ones who like to make a lot of noise. They like loud noises because they're receiving more of that sensory input. Also because these children have the dull sense, they may be the ones that you'll have to repeat their name more than once or repeat a direction, a task to them more than once because they're not filtering that information. The next one is smell. That's called olfactory. And the children who are hypersensitive, easy enough, they just don't like strong smells. They may avoid certain foods because of that. And also one that a lot of people don't think about is perfume and cologne. Children who are hypersensitive, they may avoid somebody because of their perfume or cologne, or they also might get upset or cry or have increased disruptive behaviors because of that. I've also heard that with um, laundry detergent as well. And they're also the children who are hyposensitive and they'll be the ones that will take anything and everything and put it up to their nose. They want to smell, they want to get in that input. With the children who are hyposensitive, you might also see they are the ones that have difficulty differentiating between smells. Then there is taste. Taste is under a bigger one that we call oral motor, and that's just dealing with anything dealing with the mouth and inside of the mouth. So a child who is hypersensitive, again, they can be hypersensitive with strong or intense flavored foods, like pepper, as we discussed in the last video. These children also might not like their mouth being touched, and they also may be the ones that are picky eaters or they don't like certain textures of food. They also might be the ones when they're eating certain foods, they may gag because of that. Then there are children who are hyposensitive. And as we stated before with pepper, they'll want more pepper. They'll want um, any strong tasting food. They're also the ones who might take any object and put it in their mouth. This is similar to babies who they explore different objects by putting things in their mouth. Um, it is just another way of they're using their taste buds and their, their tongue to explore that object. 
And these children also might be the ones who, because they're trying to get more oral motor input, they'll chew on their shirt or if they have a necklace, they'll chew on that necklace as well because they're trying to get more of that input. They also might like gum and they like anything, anything that they can chew, they might like. <laughs> the next one I'm gonna talk about is touch, which is tactile. And touch is dealing with you touching things with your hands, but also any part of the body. So you, a child who's hypersensitive might not like if their arms are touched, their legs are touched, or their back is touched. They might be hypersensitive to that. They might be the ones who don't like to wear clothes. There are some textures they might not like the feel of. These children also might avoid water. So anything dealing with the different textures um, or anything dealing with uh, a unique feel to it, they may avoid that. And then the children who are hyposensitive, they like to touch anything and everything. They like the different textures. Um, they are also the ones who may engage in self-injurious behavior. Those are the children who may bang their head against the wall. They might be the ones that if they have a wound or scab, they might pick at that wound or scab. Or they're also the ones who might rub different parts of their body to the point where they're sore. Obviously, we don't want this type of behavior. But part of the reason why this behavior happens is because that pain, the pain receptors, it's a very strong and intense feeling. And so since these children, their senses are dull, they're hyposensitive to touch, they will engage in that type of behavior because it is an intense feeling. The next one I'm gonna talk about is vestibular. And vestibular is just how your body responds to movement. So if you're in a car and your eyes are closed, you can sense when the car is moving. Um, or if you're in an elevator, you can sense when the elevator is moving. So children who are hypersensitive, they are the ones who don't like any of that movement. They might not like to be picked up. They might not like to be in the elevator or in a car. Um, and they might get dizzy very easily. Also might not like swings or slides as well. And the children that are hyposensitive to movement, they like that movement. Now the movement that they like, it can be rapid movement. So they like running, jumping, skipping. They like anything fast. They are the ones that, you know, if you have them seated in a chair, they can't sit down for more than two seconds. Um, but then there's also slow movement. So that could be children who like to rock back and forth, or they like something that is more subtle movement. It's still movement, it's just not as fast. And so the last one I'm gonna talk about is proprioception, and that is knowing where your body is in space. So I know this one may be difficult for people to understand. I'm just gonna provide a, a list of examples of where you might see somebody have difficulties with proprioception. I'm not necessarily going to uh, differentiate between hyper and hyposensitivity. So these children might be the ones where they'll be very clumsy. They'll have poor body awareness, so they might slouch a lot instead of sitting up straight because they're not aware of where their body is in that relative space. So one example of a child that has difficulty with proprioception is something as simple as giving somebody a high five. So a, child, a typically developing child, um, it's not strange or abnormal for them to miss when they, first give, when they first try and give somebody a high five. The difference is, is that with a typically developing child, they can miss the first time and the second time they can self-correct. So they'll know, they'll understand the first time that their arm went a little too left or a little too right. So the next time they can self-correct that and hit, hit the target, hit the other hand. With a child that has difficulty with proprioception, so difficulty with that coordination piece of things, they'll miss the first time and they won't know what to change the second time around. They won't know, oh, I, my arm was a little too left or my arm was a little too right. They won't be aware of how to move their arm in that relative space to hit that target. Now, when I say that, I'm talking about a child who does not have any visual difficulties, solely proprioceptive because there could be a portion of it if a child has issues with visual, they might not be able to see or understand where their arm goes. Children who are seeking some of that input, they might be the ones that like to be in tight spaces. So maybe they like to crouch in between the couch or the sofa 
and the wall or they might be the ones that like really really tight hugs so I actually had an experience um, during one of my rotations where I worked with a child who was seeking a lot of proprioception, proprioceptive input. And that usually looks like deep, it's deep pressure. So this child, he was nonverbal and he would purposely get himself in trouble or try and run out of the treatment session because we would have to grab him and hold him down so he can't leave the facility and that is seeking proprioceptive input. So it took a few of us to understand why were these behaviors happening, and then we realized he automatically smiled and calmed down once we grabbed him. And that's when we realized if we give him more proprioceptive input, he'll have those decreased behaviors, which is exactly what happened. So I tried to make this as basic and simple as I possibly could. I know you all are not occupational therapists, but hopefully you were able to learn from this. Um, and the next time you see your child or you're working with a child with autism, try and observe what their sensory needs may be. So try and think of these examples and see if you see anything similar, but also if you see them engage in any type of play, see what they gravitate towards or also see what they avoid. In the next video, I will talk about ways that you can provide your child with some sensory input. They'll just be examples and little tidbits that will hopefully help you and your child. Thank you.